and welcome to episode 52 of the Heskin Cast podcast, where I will be reviewing season three, episode two of the Netflix original series, Stranger Things. And, uh, you know, my voice is sounding a little weak today because I haven't really spoken much, but, uh, you know, I'm going to roll with it. You know, I, I had forgotten to mention, actually, I did mention in the original opening that I re-recorded and then forgot to mention that uh, today is quite a historic day. Not only is it July 4th, but we had a huge earthquake in Southern California, which we felt the effects here in Las Vegas. It was a 6.6 is the highest number I've seen on this scale. And uh, interestingly, there were several other earthquakes that happened. Uh, I thought they were aftershocks. I'm not really sure if they were or not. They could have been uh, the feeling of the actual earthquake or aftershocks. I don't know. But uh, it was happening randomly during the day here where uh, we would feel a little bit of shaking. But the first one was actually pretty intense. Uh, I would say it lasted a good 15 seconds or so. I even got to the point where I uh, stood under my doorway just to be safe. And usually I'm like, ah, you know, it'll last a couple seconds. I'm fine. Probably the the most intense earthquake I felt in my lifetime, and I felt a few. But let's see. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Stranger Things. I'm digging the season so far, guys. I am uh, now two episodes in and enjoying it. And I thought I would, uh, as much as I want to hurry up and see what goes on in episode three, I thought I would take a break from that and talk about episode two before I get uh, confused as to what comes from what episode. Hopefully I took better notes this time because I feel like my notes were a little uh, jumpy over the uh, the course of the first episode. So hopefully these are a little bit better. And, uh, you know, let's dig in. So the episode starts with uh, my favorite character, Billy, who, you know, is kind of one of those people that if I could just uppercut him into a punch bowl, I would totally love to do that. And I'm not even a violent person. Uh, it's just one of those characters that you need in a show, but God, you just hate them so much, but that's what makes them work. And absolute kudos to the actor because he's doing a great job really bringing those uh, intense emotions out in me, which are pretty rare. It usually takes a, a lot of uh, either just incredible stupidity or ignorance or hatred for me to get all riled up about anything these days. But uh, yeah, as a character in, in, in the show, he's doing a great job of uh, making that happen. So we start out with Billy kind of where see, uh, episode one ended with him getting dragged down the stairs and then not really sure I understand what happens here, but somehow he gets back in his car, which is now working, even though it wasn't like 10 seconds ago. And uh, he makes it to a phone booth, but now he's in the upside down. So I don't know whether he actually made a call or whether he was in the upside down making a call. It's a little bit fuzzy to me how all that actually played out. But either way, He's in the upside down and there's this whole other group of people that we have no idea who they are because they're all in the shadow and the upside down version of himself comes to speak with him where he's screaming, what do you want? And the thing says, you know, build stuff. And I don't know if this is a, uh, you know, a throwback to build it and they will come or whatever, but it, the whole thing is a little bit weird, probably not really meant to be fully understood at this point because his actions don't follow that process. And uh, then, then you know, the show starts back to, to Mike lying to Eleven. But following Billy's storyline, the next time we see him, he's at the pool, somehow made it to his job. I don't know if it's him, a combination of him or him from the upside down, or if they switch places or what is going on exactly, because it's almost like he's really drunk or on some kind of psychotic drug where he's not seeing things properly, but yet he managed to show up for work. It just, I don't know, the whole thing's kind of weird. And then, of course, he uh, he gets cornered by Karen, who now wants to apologize for not showing up the night before. So now we know that after she saw her husband and child asleep, she was just too overcome with emotion and decided not to go meet him and start their torrid love affair. Uh, I think that was a good decision. I kind of like that about her that at the end of the day, she still, uh, you know, wants to be a decent person and do the right thing, despite the raging hormones and, and whatever's going on with her, the probably the lack of feeling attention or, or that she's cared about at home. Um, you know, and I get that, but at the end of the day, she did the right thing. So good for her. But then they do the thing where Billy, you know, smashes her head, but then that was just something he thought of and he didn't actually do. So you know, I kind of feel like that trope's been way overplayed over the course of years in different films and television shows. 
I, I get showing his side of it, but it wasn't like, it wasn't done with any extra tinting or, you know, a, like a, a blurry vision or view of it or anything that said this was just his mind doing this and not actually happening. I think they tried to pull that off to get you to believe that he really did that to her and then said, oh, wait, no, that didn't happen. So I, I didn't really care for that. Uh, I don't mind the idea of it. I just think that they could have, you know, just shown right away that it was something that he was thinking and not actually doing to her. But uh, you know what? Good for her for for jumping in and confronting the situation and not waiting till he approached her. I like that. I like that about her. And uh, once again, great choice to bring Karen back into the fold. Uh, just, you know, horrible thing to uh, to pull off that crappy little, you know, let's pretend this happened and then it really didn't happen. Head smash. But what's going on with Billy? So I I don't really understand. So he he gets told to build something and then he kidnaps the other girl that checks on him instead of Karen, because we I'm going to guess that we need Karen for other stuff later. And uh, and then he kidnaps this girl. I'm guessing she's some sort of sacrifice, but I don't know how that helps the plot of building whatever he's supposed to build. Um, didn't that hasn't really made a lot of sense to me. But again, like I said in the last uh, episode, I don't know what this is setting up. This could be setting up something for episode three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. I don't know. But as it stands so far, just what I'm seeing and judging on this episode alone, I don't know what's going on with him. Um, hopefully we'll figure it out at some point. So Mike and Eleven are having some issues because he's lying to her, even after he knows that the most important thing in the world to her is that friends don't lie. So, of course, they've been dating for like a week and now he's already lying to her because he can't tell her the truth that Hopper is kind of threatening him to stay away from her. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I could see him protecting Hopper, but I don't really get the impression that's what he's doing. I think he's just kind of afraid to tell her the truth because of reasons. I don't know what he expects she's going to do. But they've always been able to work things out before. So unless he's protecting Hopper, I really don't understand his motivation for lying to her and not telling her the truth, especially when he knows how uh, important it is for her to know that she can trust the uh, very few people that she's opened up herself to. So that's kind of a strange thing. And then, um, then, then we see this whole shopping montage, which is actually kind of cool. I, I really thought it was sweet. And uh, it, it's nice to see, as I had suspected in the trailer, that uh, the two girls are bonding, having some moments together. Screw guys. Um, they're just going to hurt us and lie to us. So let's uh, let's build this bond between the two of us. I thought the whole shopping montage and thing was kind of cool. I thought the uh, the older girls looking down on them and then Elle taking revenge was kind of cool. Um, actually, really like that. I, it 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 seemed like it took a lot of effort for her to do that, but. Uh, even though really she could probably just do that with a blink of an eye compared to everything else she's done. But, uh, it was definitely a cute scene, kind of heartwarming seeing the two girls bond. Um, and then of course, inevitably they, they catch Mike and clan at the mall and, uh, you know, then Eleven's like, you know what, we're done. And I get that pretty cool. Uh, good for her to stand up for herself instead of, you know, cause Will's kind of been her world up to this point. So for her to find some independence and strength on her own. I think it's pretty neat. And uh, I like that the two girls are bonding. Max is a good character. I don't really know what's going on with her and, and, and her boyfriend at this point, because obviously they've just had a lot of up and down issues and um, they haven't really delved into that storyline too much yet. So I think there's just a lot that's inferred of stuff that's happened that we haven't seen. And that's OK. Um, but it's kind of nice. The, the question I have is so they go to get the ice cream and, and uh, Steve's like, hey, you're not supposed to be here, are you? But he doesn't tell Dustin. He doesn't even mention, hey, Max and Eleven were just here. And, uh, you know, e even in the midst of all this Russian translation, I don't know, that seemed kind of weird. But we'll get back to them in a minute. Uh, but Steve, Steve uh, serves them some ice cream and then they go all the way outside the mall. Then they're on the bus. Like, how long does ice cream in the summertime last and not just melt through the bottom of the cone and get all drippy? I don't remember that ever happening. I think the show takes place in like Illinois or something and... I grew up in Michigan, so there's probably a similar humidity factor. I don't really think ice cream would have lasted that long in Michigan. I don't know. Maybe Elle's got some sort of magic ice cream duration spell or something. 
but uh, but that was just a little thing that I noticed that uh, much like the things I talked about in episode one doesn't really make sense, but it's not really an integral to the plot kind of thing. What is more integral to the plot that doesn't make sense is Steve not mentioning to Dustin that Elle and Max were just at the mall. Even a casual mention of that seems like it would have been something that would have happened. So uh, not really uh, not really liking the fact that, that he didn't mention that, at least up to this point. So we find out that the uh, the ice cream partner, we find out that her name is, I think it was Robin. And um, she's actually pretty cool. I, I, I dig her. I like that sort of uh, standoffish Aubrey Plaza in uh, Parks and Rec kind of character where she's like, I'm going to get involved, but I'm really just going to keep to myself and speak very monotone and um, just kind of do my own thing. But I'm going to be a part of you guys, but I'm still going to be on my own. It's kind of weird. But uh, but I, I dig it. She's cool. I think that she's going to be a lot more helpful than she wants to be or intends to be. And I see her getting roped into this fairly quickly because she probably doesn't have anything else happening in her life other than her little ice cream job. They haven't showed anything about her family, where she comes from, anything at all. So we really don't know her. Uh, so for now, I can only base it on what I've seen in the episode. And, you know, adventures or mysteries are always kind of cool. It's always fun to get on board and solve a puzzle and uncover the the answer to a mystery so i kind of get her just even being interested in it um so they're trying to break the code and then they go outside and they hear the horse randomly okay why would steve want to ride this horse in the middle of all of this that doesn't make any sense to me unless he was sort of called to do it but we haven't seen any connection between him emotionally and paranormal issues so I don't really know why he was all interested in riding the horse at that point. And of course, it just happened to be playing the, the same song that he heard on the tape. Um, again, that's kind of one of those, I have a hard time buying this kind of things. But maybe we'll find out down the road that he actually does have some sort of psychic connection to all of this and it will have made sense. Or maybe, you know, subconsciously he had seen someone ride the horse and remembered the music, but didn't remember that's what it was from. I don't know. I hope for better for that because him just going, hey, in the middle of all of this and you guys walking away and us trying to solve this mystery, I want to ride this plastic horse that's way beneath me at my age and my level of coolness and my hair curl. Um, not really buying it. But again, just me. So uh, that's pretty much where the storyline ended with them was going, oh, my God, this music is the same. It's not a coincidence. This transmission happened here even though it's not possible that the company that manufactures these horses would have used the same generic carnival music on a plastic horse in front of a Kmart in Russia or in front of a mall or, or whatever. Um, I think it's a bit of a leap for them to just go, oh no, this was recorded here because I have this horse that plays this music. Um, it just seems like the carnival music would be a very common thing for that type of, uh, of, of horse. And, um, I don't know. It just it just seems like uh, they're they're making a lot of assumptions trying to solve a very important mystery that they understand the value of. So uh, a little bit silly uh, to me. And uh, I like I like Joyce in this one. I like that she kind of figured out that there's an issue with the magnets. And uh, of course, it could have been the metal on the door. Something could have happened to affect the metal and not the magnets themselves. But she went with magnets because the same thing happened in her house. I get that smart move. Goes and seeks out the teacher. And the teacher, of course, just happens to have an experiment or and some data to, to help explain things to her that conveniently takes too long. And she completely blows off Hopper, who in, in good Hopper nature just tends to get drunk and angry at the restaurant. And uh, but she doesn't you know, she doesn't ever go, oh, my God, I was supposed to meet Hopper. And I know what restaurant we're supposed to meet at. So maybe I should call the restaurant and just let him know that something came up. Instead, she's just all enthralled with magnets and this experiment that took way too long with the explanation. Totally blows Hopper off just for the purpose of him being able to get drunk and, and angry after uh, being incredibly overzealous at his defeat over his daughter's dating. Um, so I thought that was kind of a uh, a bit odd, but I also get being caught up in the moment, but you know, I don't know, maybe it's just a, a more of a, of a thing I would see in the current times where people just get all caught up and ignore people they've made commitments to versus back then from what I remember in the eighties, because we didn't have so much going on that we would forget about our friends or people that, you know, meant something to us. So, uh, I think that's a little over-exaggerated, but, uh, that's, that's the way that they chose to go with it. And, uh, 
Let's see, wrapping things up here. So Nancy and Charlie are out investigating the rat call from episode one. And the woman, I don't know how this older lady found the energy to capture this rat that is just full of energy and uh, bouncing all over the cage. I, I can't even fathom how she would have caught this thing, but she did. So let's just assume that whatever battle happened, she won. And uh, of course, the rat is just bouncing off the cage all over the place and Charlie can't get a decent picture. And don't you know, as soon as Charlie turns him back, his back, that's when it gets interesting. The rat explodes into the pile of goo that we've seen the other rats do. And then it starts moving towards something. What we have no idea, I'm guessing probably to rejoin the mass that it came from, whatever that might be. And uh, this is probably going to just form whatever the current... A uh, big creature is that they have to fight at the end because this, this show is kind of like a video game. I mean, at the end of season one, at the end of season two, there's like a big boss that they have to fight and defeat. And uh, I'm sure Elle will be thrust into the mix of risking her life to make sure that uh, the creature is defeated. And Mike, of course, will be like, no, I love you. Don't do this. And she'll be like, no, I have to because no one else can. And she'll get a bloody nose and then she'll be fine. Um, but uh, But Nancy gets a lead on uh on reports of rats going nuts so she pulls charlie away to go find that out he assumes he's done filming because the rat's just doing nothing but running around and jumping up on the walls of the cage nothing's happening so i, I don't blame him for splitting um right before the rat split uh so then they just go off and that's the last we see of them and then you know at the mall when uh when 11 breaks up with mike and she's like we're so done now and he's like uh um Will's like, oh, cool. Can we play Dungeons and Dragons now? Which is just kind of a insensitive thing. You know, he sees that his friend is heartbroken, that he just lost his girlfriend, that it's L of all people who could do anything she wanted to them just out of anger or, or stress or whatever. Um, definitely not somebody that you want to mess with. But instead, they choose to, uh, he chooses to say, hey, can we play Dungeons and Dragons now? And I think part of this is like, I'm still young and innocent and want to have fun. And I'm not really in the same place that you guys are again, pushing that separation a little bit that we saw so much of in episode one. And, and so very little of here. Uh, it could be just that I'm still a little bit younger than you guys. And I just want to play games and have fun. And I don't really understand the serious stuff that you guys are dealing with. So uh, I could be wrong, but that could be the, uh, the direction that they're kind of heading with that just to show that his, he is a little bit younger than the rest of them. And, uh, his interests lie not in uh, Oogie Girls just yet. But uh, time will tell. We'll see where they're going with it. But uh, overall, a pretty decent episode. I think it's uh, really just setting up stuff that's going to happen in subsequent episodes. I don't think that anything too major happened here. I think it's just like, okay, we need to set up the story for the rest of the season and maybe uh, even going into season four. Uh, nothing really developed much on the romance side except for the breakup between Mike and Elle. Um, and maybe a little bit of separation with Hopper and Joyce because she did kind of just ditch him at the restaurant and didn't follow up. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. And I think that's part of that slow development between the two of them. I think eventually they'll get together, uh, but maybe not. It, it's, a, it's a pretty common thing that um, people who, you know, the audience expects to fall in love when they do the show's kind of over. So they might save that for quite some time or they might like get together and it doesn't really work. And then there's still that chemistry. I don't know. I kind of see that something like that happening. Um, the only other thing I, I don't really understand what's going on with Hopper is where his, uh, where his responsibility lies. You know, he's with, uh, with Joyce in the store and, and he gets radioed. And he's like, you better get down here. He's like, I'm in the middle of something. And he really wasn't in the middle of anything that was more important than his job as the sheriff of that town. That's his responsibility to keep the peace in a town where already so many weird things have happened. Um, it just kind of seemed lame that he was trying to blow that off just to hang out with Joyce when I think he takes his job pretty seriously in general. And then after his speech with the mayor, who um, is obviously just in it to protect his own interests, uh, I don't care who I step on to get reelected, that sort of thing. The point is I get reelected. I know how to manipulate people, all that. So, the the mayor sends uh, Hopper out to uh, break up the protest and say, you know, you couldn't uh, you can protest, but you just need to do it the right way, which is absolutely the correct thing. They had no right to protest without having the proper permits. I get that they're upset. I get that they're angry. I would be too. 
But you know that if you do things without doing them the proper way, the chances are you might go to jail. You might uh, get shooed off at, at the very least. And to argue that, uh, you know, you kind of know, you know, those things. So uh, I, I was OK with Hopper taking that position. And the mayor was right. You know, they don't have the right to protest. So we need to get them out of there, make it OK for everybody else who wants to walk in there, who's, who's not doing anything wrong. But then then the um, the dis- the disappointment line came. You know, Hopper is is very calmly explaining the situation to uh, to his friend, and uh, his, you know his friend has to say the one line that's uh, just. You know, Hopper says you have to do this. Uh, I, I I'm trying to remember the exact line that he said, but um, something about um, the the proper program channels, like you know, getting the permit through the proper program channels. And Henry is like, there's been nothing proper about what this guy's done. Like, I, I, this is why arguments and conversations and things don't work because people's rebuttals don't really match what they're rebutting. It just is, let's twist that word to our benefit so that we sound intelligent and people will get on our side. And the fact of the matter is, yeah, it might be true, but you still were responsible for getting the right paperwork and the right clearance to demonstrate a protest. And so you could argue, you know, you could turn Hopper's words around on him about things being proper and say, well, this guy didn't do anything proper, so I shouldn't have to do anything proper. And it's it's a completely invalid argument. And I hear things like that all the time when I hear people fight or discussions I've had with people. It's just uh, immature, unintelligent, and, and doesn't really work. So, uh, but but I get the that the writers were writing the reality of what someone's response would probably be. And I think that's probably pretty dead on. So kudos to them for actually doing it. But to the character that said it, Henry, um, dude, that's not even a valid argument. So, uh, but I get that you're angry. I get that you feel uh, messed with. This is your life. It's affecting your family. So, you know, I, I get the pushback, but as always just, you know, if you would have done things right, then people would be still listening to you talk instead of being ushered off in a police car. Um, so that's about it for this episode, really. Um, pretty much just setting things up for for down the road. And I'll be curious to see how the next episode unfolds. I hope that this is interesting to you guys, at least, because it's, uh, you know, just my take on what I see. And I see things the way that I see them. And some things I, I might be a little critical or harsh on, like sound design or score, because that's kind of my forte. But also it's just general storytelling. You know, it, it's it's just got to make sense. So I uh, hope that you will come back for my review of episode three, which I will be doing shortly. And uh, have a great day, everybody. Enjoy your fourth.